Um, so we don't have a ton of time, so I just want to jump right in. You ready to jump right in? Let's jump right in. Uh, and in fact, uh, James' presentation was really a good segue yeah, it was perfect. to a lot of things that uh, we might talk about, although we haven't rehearsed. We have not. We had a short conversation, but mostly yeah. gossip. Um, okay, the, most of the speakers here this morning and, and last night, when asked about how AI is going to change the American workforce, have said something to the effect of, it'll be fine. There will be new jobs to replace the old jobs. They'll be more or less just as good. This has happened with every technological revolution. You know, we showed the headlines last night. It, all of this fear is, um, happens with every revolution. Why is this one different? Uh, it's different because of the pace of technological change, uh, Nellie. And I, I agree that there will be more jobs uh, to replace the old ones that are lost. In other words, the issue is not the number of jobs. The issue is the quality of the jobs. And James really touched on it at the end of his presentation. Uh, if you have a hollowing out of the middle class, you have a continuation uh, of what we've had in some ways for the last 25 years. And that is socially and economically and politically dangerous. Give me your vision of the American labor force in the, the year 2050, if, if this goes unchecked, if the government doesn't step in. Uh, what is it going to look like? What, give me some of your worries here. Uh, well, again, I don't want to rain on a parade that is very exciting. I mean, I basically tell you, know, we don't this want to be neo-Luddites, and we do want to celebrate the things that are being uh, hatched and developed and will come along, particularly with artificial intelligence. But let me just say that if nothing changes, if we're on a steady state, what we see in San Francisco and the peninsula is really going to be seen across the country. That is, we're going to have a relatively small number of extraordinarily wealthy people who are either uh, have the right education or were at the right time and the right place uh, or who have the exact right position with regard to capital markets and invention. Uh, and a large number of people who are going to be working, but working at a very low wage. They're going to be working at jobs that are essentially caring and attention intensive jobs. Uh, jobs that, uh, you know, there's no limit to the number, of, the amount of care and attention people want and are, if they could pay for them, would be willing to pay for. So we'll have a great number of people in the restaurant and hotel and uh, child care and elder care and uh, doing all kinds of caring occupations, but they're paid very, very little. And when you get that hollowing out of the middle jobs, uh, I, you know, I just worry about uh, all of the things that we've already seen in this country, we're already seeing, we're already witnessing. Why AI in particular? Why is this innovation going to do that versus any other innovation? Uh, innovations have done to some extent that for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, differently than what we saw in the last industrial revolution, the, the turn of the last century where we had electricity and railroads and we had uh, steam engines and mm. uh, a, lot of, a lot of innovations that created jobs that people could train for pretty easily. Mm -hmm. These new jobs, um, and again, James put his finger on it, uh, require major investments in human capital. If we're going to avoid the hollowing out of the middle class in terms of uh, there not being kind of good jobs that our children and our grandchildren can aspire to, uh, at least many of them, uh, then we, uh, we're in trouble. The only way we get them is if we have, and we can get into what the policies are. Yeah, uh, it, it's not, I'm not resigned to that kind of a world. We don't have to resign ourselves to that kind of a world, but we do have to get very serious about different kinds of inventions, different ways of organizing the labor market. I want to get to some of those solutions because I know you've talked about those in the past. The, um, would, you feel, would you say that you feel right now optimistic about our government's ability to intervene and prevent some of these um, what could be sort of massive changes from happening? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not optimistic about our government's ability to do anything. Uh, and, uh, and it's not just the current government. I mean, I was and I'm privileged to be part of a, um, a government, Clinton administration, that took human capital issues very, very seriously. I, and yet, uh, for a variety of reasons that um, we don't have time to get into, were, was unable 
to do the kinds of investing and the kinds of institutional labor market changes mm. that we had wanted to do. I think what, what's something that you wanted to do that Oh, for example, do? the simplest thing. This has been in the mid 1990s. Um, we thought it very important to make community colleges the hubs of technical training that would link the community colleges to employers and provide a lot of people with uh, lifelong learning that they needed. Now this was mid-1990s. Mm. That was extraordinarily hard to do. It was hard to get yeah. money for. It was hard to get people excited by. Uh, we have in this country a conceit that everybody needs to go to a four-year college in order to get into the middle class. And that's, that conceit is a post-World War II conceit. Uh, it, we have to give up that conceit because it has nothing to do, certainly with the labor market we are going to have in the future, but it had nothing to do with what we had in the 1990s either. Yeah. What, um, what are some of the solutions? I, I feel like every couple months I get pitched something like, like a universal basic income and, and I'm, not, I'm not totally sure what's real and what actually is going to work to prevent this. It seems almost like this inevitable revolution that's happening and there's not really much to stop it, but, but maybe I'm totally wrong. And what well, I, I think that there is nothing that is going to stop these forces and we can't try to stop the forces. We shouldn't try to stop the forces, but I think the forces themselves are going to unleash possibilities for labor market changes. Uh, people will understand, uh, the, the public broadly will understand things that they don't maybe understand right this moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, what I was just talking about in terms of the conceit over a four-year college degree, I think there's more and more interest in developing what we should have developed a while back, and that is a world-class system of lifelong learning and technical education so that people can move in and out of the private sector, can get the training they need. Young people do not have to go to a four-year college, uh, and certainly not to graduate school. They can get uh, kind of a, a mastery of a domain, mastery mm -hmm. of a domain of technical knowledge that enables them uh, to continue to learn on the job. But wouldn't that just further segregate then the people who go to four-year colleges and get liberal arts degrees versus the people who go to these trade schools now? Uh, no, right now, the people who get to a four-year I mean, college degree, is the issue. people who get a four-year college degree, many of them, uh, are not seeing wage increases. In fact, entry-level wages for people with a four-year college degree are dropping right now, uh, and we don't have the people who would be installing and upgrading and monitoring uh, and uh, repairing mm -hmm. all of these automated machines. Uh, there is a mismatch. We need people who are going to be dealing with this mismatch, who are capable of doing all of this work. Uh, now, there's a completely different labor market issue having to do with uh, what happens to the large and growing population of people who are going to be in the caring and attention sector, let's call it that, yeah. uh, because computers are not going to be able to do what people do, and people are the ones who can provide care and attention, uh, but those are going to be very low-wage jobs, and there are going to be so many people who are going to be pushed into that sector that um, those wages are probably going to be if anything, going down in real terms, adjusted for inflation. What do you do not then? Uh, well, beyond all of the labor market changes that we need, uh, such as education and job training, and even uh, the ability to move from place to place in this country, I, I, mm -hmm. this is something we should talk about, but we probably don't have time. But if any of you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it when we get to the questions, and that is that uh, the labor market is becoming less geographically mobile in this mm. country. That's a worry in terms of everything we just saw. Uh, but why beyond, would, why would AI be making it less geographically mobile? Uh, AI is not directly responsible. What's directly responsible is that the difference in living costs is growing between the coasts, for example, places where uh, a lot of uh, technology is being developed, and places that are le being left behind. And places that are being left behind, uh, it's cheap to live in, but you can't leave your job there and move to the coast. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's all becoming a sociological and economic problem that is a very pronounced problem. But beyond that, <laughs> that needs to be solved. We also, I think, have to be cognizant 
uh, of the reality of a very large and growing low wage population. Right. And what do we do about that? Well, the first thing is to enlarge something that is very boring. I'm going to just get, get ready for boredom. I'm ready. I'm going to say, I'm going to say something that uh, makes people's eyes glaze over, and it's the earned <laughs> income tax credit. Have you all got suddenly very bored? Uh, Actually, the earned I mean, you just got to clap out there for that one. Uh, did I? Well, the earned income tax credit actually is the largest anti-poverty program in the United States. It was championed by Milton Friedman and many conservative economists 40 years ago. Um, it is a wage supplement, mm -hmm. and uh, it now goes to people who are fairly low, quite low income. We're probably going to have to expand that wage supplement in years to come. Uh, simply because there are going to be many, many more people who are going to be very low income and are going to be needing that wage supplement not only to live on, but also to buy all the technology <laughs> that a lot of people around here want to sell. Do you think all the interventions are going to come from the government rather than from specific companies? Like, let's say uh, Google and Facebook have the most advanced AI right now. Or, or are they responsible in some way for, for participating in this? Or is this just a government problem that has to be solved? Uh, no, nothing is a government problem that has to be solved. Everything now has got to originate, particularly when we're talking about AI, has got to originate with the private sector. Uh, but it is too much, I think, to expect the private sector is going to do it itself. Uh, Google and, uh, and Apple and all of the other technology firms, they are not going to actually create uh, a either a wage supplement or lifelong learning systems or whatever, uh, although they could contribute to that. I think that what we need, and we can't expect other companies to provide lifelong learning for their employees. I wish we could, but the pattern has been less and less investment in lifelong learning. Uh, but what- How do they get encouraged to- But what these companies could do is lobby government for the financing. Uh, and, uh, and, and design the programs. Uh, this also has a bearing on what you mentioned a moment ago, and that is uh, universal basic income, mm -hmm. which I think is inevitable, but not soon. That is, uh, I cannot imagine in the present political climate uh, having anything that looked like a universal basic income. And by the way, with universal basic income, I'm just defining it as a minimum that a subsistence level income that keeps everybody out of poverty, they can, they, people would have incentives to work above and beyond the uniform basic income. Why is it going to take so long? Why, why has it been so hard? Uh, it's, it, because it runs counter to a lot of the assumptions people now have about work and income. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of our programs, public programs at the state and federal level, are now going in the opposite direction. Like Medicaid, we are now allowing states to require work for getting Medicaid mm. uh, so that uh, there is less and less tolerance in a, in a kind of ironic way. So it's a culture change that it's has a, to happen. More well, than it, it's an intellectual and culture change. Um, if we, we're going to get a, even a bigger earned income tax credit, uh, I think people have got to understand that their children and their grandchildren could very easily be part of this large and growing group of low-wage workers, mm -hmm. uh, who, by the way, also, just to throw another piece of concern, not worry, but concern into the hopper, uh, job security is disappearing. Uh, right, uh, you know, uh, 15 years ago, we had about, uh, if I remember the statistics, about 15% of the workforce was in contingent or uh, freelance work of some sort, contract workers. Uh, today, it's the best estimate I've seen is 24%. Uh, and it is growing very, very fast. Uh, many of the forces propelling this are the behind. same ones behind everything else we're talking about. Yeah. What about, okay, to flip this, what about those who say, hey, maybe this is great. Like, it's, it's great that we have a, that I have a washing machine so I don't have to be scrubbing my own clothes. And, and um, like, Elon Musk has this thing where he says that AI is going to turn all of us into house cats. We're all going to be, like, kind of wandering around with no jobs. And, and 
um, that, and, and sort of controlled by these oligarchs and computers. My cat seems really happy. <laughs> and Nellie, I want you to know that I'm happy that your cat is happy. <laughs> um, Why, like, what if this is great? Well, uh, look, um, in the 19, starting in the 1930s through the 1950s, we had a lot of futurologists who were predicting that technology would take away all jobs and that our greatest problem was going to be how to decide how to use our leisure time. Uh, in fact, uh, John Maynard Keynes in 1928 uh, wrote uh, a book, uh, that actually a long essay, uh, that predicted by 2028 we would all be out of work. And that was a great thing because we could all be painters and, and writers and we could be invested in our communities and that would be wonderful. But what those futurologists yeah, uh, what starting, happened? well, they didn't actually think about the recirculation of the money. They didn't think about what you would expect, particularly John Maynard Keynes of all people, to think about. And that was how we got money in people's pockets. Uh, uh, and that, again, is what we are now talking about in terms of widening the earned income tax credit or even the universal basic income. That is how people are going to live uh, if they are not going to be working full time or at least at full time high paying or middle paying jobs. So you kind of agree with the cat hypothesis? I agree with the cat hypothesis to the extent that I think it's great your cat is happy. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I, well, let me, I, I said that too fast. I think that work gives human beings structure and meaning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of people would be perfectly fine without work as long as they had income. But it still leaves many people uh, without any structure and meaning in their lives. And I think that we've got to worry about that as well. Mm. Is there anything that our President Donald Trump is doing right now that you think is good, that's working in the sort of U US labor in this sort of zone that we're talking about? Is there anything he's doing that you're like, you know what, that's working, that's good? Uh, well, I'll tell you one thing that he has said uh, that I completely agree with, and that is on technical education. I don't know what he has in mind, but he has talked about more technical education and beefing it up. There's no money left. I don't know where that would come from. Uh, just like infrastructure. I, th I think an infrastructure plan that is $1.5 trillion is great, uh, but there's no money left in the federal budget. We already are running a huge budget deficit. Uh, but, a technical, but, but enforcing and reinforcing and developing a, a world-class technical education system uh, is very, very important. Hmm. If you, you know, actually we're going to do a watch exercise. Close your eyes. Like, actually close them. Actually close them. Okay. <laughs> okay, you are Donald Trump right now. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're asking a lot, Nellie, and I can, I can imagine a lot of things, but go ahead. What do you do right now to make American labor force better? To, 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 to save us from the cat apocalypse? The, the first, just one thing. Uh, well, beyond, I mean, we've talked about five things, right? And I think any one of the five would be useful. That is, uh, improving technical education, making that, uh, and I'll be more detailed about it. I think the last year of high school and the first year of post high school uh, should be, uh, for many students, a, an opportunity to develop mastery over a technical range of, of issues. Uh, lifelong learning critically important, uh, and uh, is that community college? Uh, where, who does that? Uh, every company should be doing it, but most companies are not, uh, and how do you give them the right incentives? Now, maybe Donald Trump would say, well, maybe a special tax incentive for companies to do, maybe one and a half percent of their payrolls into job training that is designed to increase the skills of their employees. Great, I mean, that would be one direction to go in. Uh, I don't know how Republicans and the Trump administration feel about the earned income tax credit, although, as I said, it is uh, something that conservatives and conservative economists have been pushing for years and years. Uh, uh, here's, uh, and we could go on, but here's one thing that I think uh, it's important to be very cognizant of. 
because I, a couple of months ago I was out in Kentucky and I go out to uh, red states, let's call them, uh, places where there is not much positive economic activity, where a lot of people yeah. are, uh, are, are basically wallowing. Yeah. I, I talked to a bunch of truck drivers. Now that's, this is why this is important. Wait, what the New York Times does every, every couple of months. Uh, I'm making a joke. Oh, well, uh, well I, I didn't, <laughs> I was talking to truck drivers. I didn't intend it to be around truck drivers, but, but there are certain states in which truck driving is the major occupation. And uh, it was interesting to me that Kentucky is one of the states where the truck driving is the number one. There are many other occupations, but more people are involved in truck driving as an occupational group than yeah. any others. Uh, and we talked about what they were experiencing and what their futures were going to be. And the thing that they wanted to talk most about was driverless technology. Because they all felt that over the next eight to ten years, they would be out of a job. And what were they going to do about it? Now, this is in red state America. I love the this idea is you in, wandering around like a harbinger of the apocalypse here. Well, it's, like, you know, it, it wasn't apocalyptic because I think they were more apocalyptic than okay. I was. Also, people start thinking about questions. We're going to go to questions in like one second. Well, uh, but you asked me about Donald Trump. Uh, these are Republican states that have many jobs that are going to be directly affected over the next eight to ten years by uh, various forms of, of AI and automated technology. Uh, which to me is interesting because that may signal uh, a political change in terms of the willingness of many uh, people, Donald Trump and Republicans and others, uh, to invest in ways that I'm talking about right now, where it doesn't seem realistic. Like maybe it'll take a certain level of sort of mass anger, mass rage. Well, we, also, we already have a lot of mass anger and rage. Uh, unfortunately, it's been directed, I think, in the wrong, in wrong places. Uh, but I think that people, once they experience, once they begin to experience job displacement, not that they are not going to be able to get a new job. They will, but the new job is going to pay less than the old job. Yeah. And so they might be ready for uh, a variety of ideas. I mean, yeah. uh, one thing we haven't, I know you want to go to questions. One thing we haven't talked about is wage insurance. Uh, other countries are trying wage insurance. Denmark is trying wage insurance. Mm. So that if your new job pays less than the money. old job, then you get for a period of time the difference between the pay of the new job and the old job. We don't have anything like that in the United States. Yeah. Let's go to questions. And then if, you don't, if people don't have questions, then I have more. Um, you, sir, the goatee. Technology-based vocational training, but you know, I have these similar conversations in Silicon Valley and West Virginia. And what's interesting to me is the way that people think of bulletproofing their Tesla as the alternative, right? So I have this income; it's growing. I can bulletproof my Tesla, have my own water supply, um, send my children to schools, or I can earn less and figure out how to divert that money into the economy. I can make, you know. 650 instead of 750, and I can figure out how to divert that in a way that makes meaning for people in the care professions. You know, Kane said, take the money and put it, hide it in alleys for enterprising young boys to find. It doesn't matter as long as it re results in economic growth. So I'm wondering, what were the ideas you saw for assume that there does come a self preservation oriented redistributionist ethos that comes? You know, I don't want to bulletproof my Tesla. I'll take the money and put it somewhere else. What are your best ideas besides the earned income tax credit and UBI for turning that money into making me meaning for people in the caring professions or, you know, the, changing the inevitability of those professions as being low wage and dead end? Well, there's something that we used to call fondly the minimum wage. Uh, it's been declining in real terms, federal minimum wage, uh, for about 30 years. Uh, we could raise the minimum wage. Most of the things that we need to do ra have collective action problems around them. That is, we would like to do them as individuals, but as individuals, we're not going to make that much difference. And it's even hard to convince our friends and relatives to do the same thing, which means that as individuals, we need to join with other people and actually change the rules. And the way you change the rules is you go to either a state government or a national government, and you say, you've got to have a bigger earned income tax credit, you've got to raise the minimum wage, you've got to actually have an experiment so we can learn more about UBI. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi, uh, Mike Trigg with Intello. So we've talked a lot about how AI is going to impact people sort of at the low wage, low skill end of the spectrum. Um, our company helps uh, with recruiting software, and so we tend to see the opposite end of the spectrum where there's really a labor shortage for data scientists and other kind of high skilled people to actually build these AI products. And so I'd be curious, you know, obviously, taking a low-skilled worker and making them write algorithms isn't feasible, but in a macroeconomic sense, do you see opportunity there for those high-skilled roles that there really is a shortage of today? Uh, I do. Uh, let me just say that I also uh, spend most of my time, in fact, uh, teaching at a research university, University of California, Berkeley, where we have a, a computer science is the most popular major. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, most of the young people going into computer science who are going to be doing some of the things that you're talking about, they are worried today. They're worried that they will become uh, kind of intellectual orphans, that at some point uh, there will be a new breakthrough innovation that makes everything they know uh, useless. And they are holding back from investing as much in their education and their, fa and their families and parents uh, as they might. That is, they're ma at the margin, there are a lot of people might, that might want to do this kind of computer science or get involved in it, but are not doing it because of that fear. Well, you learn uh, one language and then it's quickly... You learn something and it's quickly, it's quickly obs obsolete, or you've learned some technique or some uh, set of skills that become obsolete. And that's where lifelong learning comes in. So we've got to somehow build in, uh, not only to their psychology, but also into our institutions, some assurance that they can keep their skills up to date. I think our universities are, you know, since 1820 in the United States, since 1680 abroad, university education has been for people who are between the ages of 18 and 24, 25. We've got to get out of that mindset. Should we do one more question? I know we have coffee. You're not yelling at me yet, so the word, let's do it. <laughs> Hello, Robert. I'm Andrew Yang. I'm running for president as a Democrat in 2020 on universal basic income. I've got a two-part question for you. First, oh man, if we know that universal basic income would improve the lives of 80% of Americans if paid for by a value-added tax, why do you seem so negative about the ability to win a majority in a democracy for that policy, and the second question, if I win, would you be up for returning to DC with me? <laughs> uh, well, the second one is easy. Uh, uh, that's yes, but you're not, well, maybe you will win. I, people have won who I never thought had any chance. Of uh, but uh, let me, the first question is a good and, 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 and an important question. I was in Switzerland, uh, just before they voted on universal basic income in a referendum uh, last year. Uh, and uh, the Swiss uh, were very well informed about it. Uh, the problem that they kept on running into, and I think about uh, a, a, a minority, but not, not a negligible minority. I mean, I, a minority of Swiss did vote in favor of it, but what they worried about was the cost. Most of the uh, budgets uh, and cost estimates for universal basic income put it at, uh, well, in the United States, about $2 trillion a year. Uh, that would be a big, big chunk of the federal budget, obviously. Uh, so we've got to be clear about where the revenue streams would come from. Uh, and at this point, in addition to all of the cultural and sociological problems we, we face and political problems we face, it's not clear how we are going to actually afford it. But I don't want to come off as negative. I think a universal basic income is inevitable. Uh, I just don't think it's inevitable soon. I think it, I would be, I, I would expect in 20 years uh, or 25 years, the next generation would all be talking about it. I think that people on, in Silicon Valley uh, I've had conversations with many CEOs about universal basic income, and they are very gung-ho. Uh, and I think that uh, they may lead the charge in terms of changing public understandings, public values, and the politics of all of this. So I'm not negative. It's just a matter of when it happens. 
So I think we do have to break for coffee. <laughs>